uh, say another prayer. You are here now. Open our eyes so that we can see and open our ears and soften our hearts so that we can know that fact. Amen. When the second commandment, the abbreviated form is you shall not make for yourself an idol, was originally given, it was spoken to an ancient Middle Eastern culture who actually made things out of wood and gold, out of metal, out of stone, and bow down toward them. Representations of their gods. And my first thought was, well, we don't do that nowadays. I don't. You don't, I'm sure. The long version of the command, you shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything above or on the earth beneath it or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God punishing the children for the sin of the fathers and the mothers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to thousand, the thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. If you were around at New Hope at the epigenetics service, we now know that physiologically your DNA gets imprinted in some way and form and shapes behavior as a result of your behavior and that those genetic imprints are heritable. We do pass on biologically propensities to behaviors that we live to our kids. But we're not preaching epigenetics this morning, we're preaching this commandment this morning. Reading that command, one word strikes me, the word anything. You can make an idol out of anything that is in the heavens and the earths, the earths, the multiple earths that I live in. Oh, stick to your notes. You can make an idol out of another person. Maybe your kids or your spouse or some celebrity. Or an idea or a worldview. Say the worldview that you can live a totally self-directed autonomous life without God. You can make an idol out of a perception of reality, like how you think God works, or out of a certain place where you may think that's where you meet God, like a church or on a mountaintop. That can become an idol. Or out of a certain kind of church. I grew up in a church that made an idol out of it being the church. Uh, and that is problematic in the eyes of God and in relation to this commandment. You can make an idol out of a statement of faith or a certain view of how to read the Bible or read your world. You can make an idol out of a systematic theology. These are all my idols that I'm throwing out if you haven't figured it out. You can make an idol out of your job or out of any facet of your life, or out of money, or out of sex, or out of your family. Anything can become an idol. Whenever you put something before God, you've made it, in some great sense, a God, and created an idol. Whenever you put your ultimate confidence, love, passion, into something other than God, that thing becomes or has a very high risk of becoming an idol. So, as I confessed at the intro to the service, I am, hello, my name's John and I'm an idolater. And the question you need to ask is, are you one as well? A few self-check questions came to mind as I considered the question of, am I really somebody who has idols? What is the greatest source of joy in your life, honestly? First thing that comes to mind. Where do you ultimately put your trust? 
What do you love the most? What do you cherish the most? What gets your thoughts the most? Your time the most? For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, the commandment says. Now, nowadays we mix up jealousy with envy. Envy is an ugly kind of wanting that doesn't want that person to have what they have, and it's not a good thing. There's a commandment or teaching in the Bible about not being envious. But jealousy isn't that. Jealousy is wanting, and even to the point of demanding a love that is your love to have for yourself, not wanting that love to be given to that other thing, because that love is meant for you, and you feel jealous when that happens. God made you for Himself. And He loves you with an everlasting love, with a love that is so wide and so long and so deep, and so you can't even begin to imagine the love that God has for you. And God wants, rightfully so, nothing to come between you and His love, because God's a jealous God. And idolatry is like committing adultery on God. So how can it ever be wrong if God is truly who God is, and I've just described, for that ultimate lover to be jealous when you mess around with another God or another idol? God's perfect love for you so that you can be holy yourself, a woman, a man, a family, a community. He's everything we need. He's always with us. Come hell or high water, He is with you and will never leave you, forsake you, let you alone. Not for a long time, anyway. So why divide the love, the desire, the yearnings that God has given you? Why divide them at all and share those loves, that love with an idol? Neil Plantinga, in a book called Engaging God's World, says that when it comes to idolatry, its perpetrator becomes its victim. Divided worship destroys worshipers. Divided love destroys lovers. You know it's true. If you've had someone cheat on you, if you've cheated, if you cheat in your heart every week, divided love destroys lovers. To split the truly important longings and loyalties is to crack one's own foundations and to invite the crumbling and finally the disintegration of life itself. A divided house cannot stand. So this week I read in a psalm, in this context, these words, Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. Because my heart is bifurcated, trifurcated, quadfurcated, and my love's wander, and they look lustfully at other things, and people, and I, I pray that. I, I, I pray that for me this week, God, bring it back together and reintegrate me. Connect me again to your one love so that I may fear, not fear in the frightened sense, although the holiness of God is frightening, but know you have faith in you, live this numinous way that life is meant to be lived. I didn't know this was going to be as much of a confession as it's turning out to be. So, the question then becomes, can you do something about idolatry in terms of being less that way? 
And for me, it, maybe it's not that way for you, but for me it's always if I can understand the process of how idolatry plays out in my life, maybe then I can work against that process, have a better chance of undoing it. So, an example. One of my biggest idols, and not the one that I have the least control over because I'm not telling you about that one, but I'll tell you about this one, is money. Trusting in money before I trust in God. Letting money be my ultimate source of comfort, hope, and pleasure. Making money my security, my identity, my pre preferred path to fulfillment, peace, and joy. Now, if you go to New Hope, you're thinking, well, didn't you leave all of that behind when you left the development business and became a pastor? And not one bit. I just live out this idolatry with a lot less than I had back then. And I don't aim it for the car or the house or the next hot suit or whatever. I, I'm idolatrous in terms of the future and the end and wondering, will I be able to put gas in a car when I retire? And so it's become an idol in that place instead. It's moved from this much more superficial thing to this, well, you should be thinking about that kind of I'll trust in money kind of place. Now, money is not evil. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, Paul wrote to Timothy. Money is a good creational gift that enables you and economies to function and operate so that the world collectively can flourish and do well. We can trade. Money is a gift from God. But when I put my heart and my trust into what money can buy, money itself, then it becomes a problem. Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Idolatry begins when we take a good God-made thing and take God out of the equation. God knows you need things, knows you need money and a job and a way to feed yourself and your family. God wants to provide for you. God does provide for you via your job and your income by giving you a brain and a skill set, by dropping you into Calgary where you can get a great job for many of us. So much opportunity. God gives you. God wants to be actively engaged in all of those facets of what money means to you. He wants you to know that every step of the process is gifted by and held in the hands of God. And it struck me this week that this is the key to dealing with idolatry. To keep good things, good created things from becoming idols, you need to believe in a God who made everything and holds everything and for whom everything is destined to bring glory. Just keep that thought in your head all the time and the propensity towards idolatry will be diminished. It will not fall away because I can know something and do the exact opposite. Caveat, caveat, emptor, emptor. But it helps. I think it really helps to be cognizant of God's iconic presence in that way. The best way to keep anything from becoming an idol is to treat it as an icon, something through which you can know the true, one true God. By practicing God's presence in this way, you undermine the deception and the deceptive ways through which idolatry weaves its way, sinisterly weaves its way into your life. You're less prone to make that thing when you see it as a gift and a mere thing and something that really isn't yours that came from God and is for God's glory ultimately to, to make it a God when you carry it that way. I mean, why trust and give your life to something that isn't alive or that 
that can't speak or that has no real power. The psalmist in Psalm 115 writes, Our our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases Him. But their idols are silver and gold made by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, noses but cannot smell. They have hands but cannot feel, feet but cannot walk. Nor can they utter a sound with their throats. Those who make them will be like them. And so will all who trust in them. Worship money, and you will become your assets. You'll become net worth. Your portfolio, dead, inanimate. Worship material things and you'll become a house or a countertop or a car or a piece of technology or clothing, a wardrobe. Oh, ye of little faith, you are so much more than a wardrobe. Did I just say ye? (laughs) I was trying to quote a King James Version, but then I forgot the verse. Worship sex, and you'll become a sack of meat, which has to break the heart of God, because you are so much more than just that. You're a sexual being. God made you with this amazing gift, a beautiful ecstasy and a unity, meant to point to a beautiful ecstasy and a unity, and it happens before God every time it happens, if it's happening in your life. But you are so much more if you worship sex than just a body. So what do you want to be? Who do you want to be? If you want to be a fully alive human being, then worship the God who made you and become more and more of an image bearer, the one he made you to be. C.S. Lewis, so insightful on idolatry, writes, the money, the sex, the books, or the music in which we thought the beauty was located will betray us if we trust them. It was not in them. It only came through them. Think iconically here. Icons are things you look through to see God. It only came through them. These things, the beauty, the memory from our past, are good images of what we really desire. But if they are mistaken for the thing itself, they turn into dumb idols, breaking the hearts of their worshipers. For they are not the thing itself. They are only the scent of a flower we have not yet found the echo of a tune we have not yet heard, news from a country we have not yet visited. Money's freedom and security and the fun things and the beautiful things that we're able to do with it is a scent of a flower, capital F, that is freedom and security and adventure, and life. God blooming with us through Jesus Christ, who taught. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear, or about your car, what you will drive, or about your home, how great it is. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. Jesus gives us an icon, one that tweets outside your window every day if you have, we have ears to hear. Look at the birds of the air. They they do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Minus 11 last night, 
and those birds are still alive this morning. Feeds them. Are you not of much are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. Another icon. They do not labor or spin, and yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? Or what am I going to do about this health problem? Or how can I help this person who's in the hospital? Or how can I intervene in this busted, broken relationship? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. So the things aren't the bad things, and you've got to do these things, but don't run after them. Don't make them the ultimate source of anything. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and these things will be given to you as well. You're just rubbing your eyebrow there. I mean, look at your hand. You've got these miracles at the ends of our arms that are so dexterous and biologically brilliant and our opposable thumbs and able to do things like play piano and, 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 and do accounting and, and touch loved ones and, and God is holding your whole body and epigenetics are working now helping you fit your environment, and your kidneys are working now, and your body is in homeostasis, and your legs are with you, and your eyes can see, and your ears can hear. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear how much you hold us, God. Whether we live or we die, we belong to God. Consider your loved ones your girls. They are a scent of His gathered round you, gifting you with community love, of His incarnate care. Think of all the beautiful sounds that fill your life, echoes emanating from the voice of God. Remember the story, stories and stories and parables that Jesus told Good news from a kingdom you've yet to fully know and visit. News of grace and forgiveness now extended to chronic idolater, I, idolaters. News of a love that is out of this world. News of a God who created heaven and earth. News of a God who is with you. God is with us. God is with us right here, right now, by His Holy Spirit. He is with you. And this God is a God who is alive, who is speaking in ways you can't imagine throughout your life and through His world. He has a voice, and He moves, and He has power, and a mind, and thoughts, and gives life and direction, and hope. Uh, he's a real God who wants to love real people. What idol would you want to put before a God like that? 